preparing to live stream the webinar. There we go, we are live. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Deutsch. I'm the program manager at the Muse Writers Center. We are a literary center and nonprofit in Norfolk, Virginia, and we offer classes, uh, programs such as this one, events, partnerships, and outreach programs as well. If you're interested in more, check out the-muse.org. We also have an event coming up later tonight in addition to this one that is in person at Taste Unlimited in Norfolk, in Ghent, um, and it'll be a reading from his latest book by Tim Siebels. So be sure to check that out as well. A um, few housekeeping notes. If you are watching live in Zoom or on Facebook, there are closed captions enabled. They are auto-generated. So if you'd like to turn those on, the toggle should be at the bottom of your screen. It'll say CC. Um, and we are going to possibly, I think, have time for maybe a few questions at the end. If you are watching live and have questions in Zoom, you can put them in the Q&A section. We will hopefully have time to get to a few. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can put them in the comment section. Uh, if you're watching after the fact, it is a little late, my apologies. But I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Luisa A. Gloria, who is the Virginia Poet Laureate and a wonderful poet and teacher at the Muse and professor at ODU who will introduce today's program. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us, I'm so excited. Uh, also, it's the second day of April 2022, National Poetry Month, so it's so appropriate to be here and doing, doing poetry on a Saturday afternoon. So, but before we start, I'd like, you, um, I'd like to invite you also to check out a couple of ongoing series. Two of them are part of my projects as Poet Laureate. First, there's my Poetry Postcard Project, where you can see uh, postcards that were sent to me with one original poem and an original artwork. And you can grab those, look at those every day this April, there's gonna be a new one. Thank you so much to those who sent in your words and your images. I'm dropping the link right there in the chat for everyone. And the second one uh, that I wanna talk to you about is um, the poet spotlight in our new poets database, which has just been launched. There's going to be a new poetry prompt every day of April also, and I've collected them from Virginia and Virginia affiliated poets. And I promise you, they're also fun and inspiring. So I'll also drop the link in the chat right now. And there's an Instagram uh, where you can follow us. The links will take you to, uh, I guess, a visual uh, image of the prompt. And the third thing that I'd like you to, uh, to talk to you about is the signature National Poetry Month series of the Academy of American Poets called Dear Poet 2022. And this is a multimedia education project and students from grades five through 12 are invited to write letters inviting young people in, in, and they write letters in response to poems that they find there at the Dear Poets 2022 site. And I think you can do this until May uh, 1 of, of this year. And you can submit to Dear Poet as a teacher, you can submit to Dear Poet as a student. And then afterwards, I think they even give you a printable Dear Poet certificate of completion. So how cool is that? You can also find lots of amazing teaching resources to bring into your classroom and to share with others. Did I just give you the database um, link again? So let me do this again. I wanna give you the Dear Poets link. Um, here it is. There you go. So there are lesson plans and everything. So for young poets in the community, which we are here to celebrate, we received over 100 submissions from all across the Commonwealth. And we are, we were, and remain simply blown away by these young poets' vision, their fire, their optimism for a better world, which we can contribute to building one poem at a time, which is why the series is called this. And I couldn't have done this project or any of my laureate projects if not for the help of so many. First of all, the Academy of American Poets and the Mellon Foundation, and no less the Muse Writers Center and the Poetry Society of Virginia. So some of the Poetry Society of Virginia poet officers kindly volunteered to be part of my selection committee. So I'm gonna name them and acknowledge them, Kathy Haley, Steve Booker, Eddie Dow, and Kendra McDonald, uh, who is here. 
um, Catherine Fletcher helped to plan and organize our publicity campaign. And I know, so I think some of them besides you are here in the audience, Kendra. So I would like to invite them to very quickly um, say something, say a few words of, uh, about the program and what they saw and um, you know were inspired by. And again, thank you so much. Kathy's here too, Kathy Haley. So please go ahead, you know, whoever wants to jump in. I'll just I'll just start. Um, so I'm I was just absolutely honored to be part of this um, of this process and just inspired as always by Louisa's vision for for poetry and just making it part of our our everyday life. But I um, I was serving at the time as the um, a vice president of our Southeast region for the Poetry Society of Virginia and our. Uh, our Poetry Society will turn 100 years old next year, and I just want to mention to, to all of you young poets that um, for us to continue for another 100 years, we need you, we need your voices, and it's just, it's so incredibly inspiring that you all are choosing poetry as as your way to process this this world and to um, uh, to to make a difference that way, and know that you know you're, you're joining all the poets that came before you that that process our world in this way. So, I was just so incredibly grateful to. Uh, have been witness to all of the submissions that came in. We truly were inspired. It left me uh, feeling so hopeful. <laughs> These are crazy times that we were living in and have lived in for the past uh, couple of years. So it just brought so much joy to me to read your projects and how you uh, want to use poetry to make the world a better place, one poem at a time. Um, and I just wanted to share with you all real quickly, I read a book many years ago, um, uh, Rilke's book, Letters to a Young Poet, and there's this amazing quote in it that I just want to share to the to the young poets. Um, it, uh, the, he says, above all, ask yourself in the most silent hour of your night, do I absolutely have to write? Dig within yourself for a deep answer. And if the answer is affirmative, if you can counter this grave question with a strong and simple, I must, then build your life according to this need. And I think that you all are doing that right now by taking this step and representing your communities in this way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kendra. You know, that quote still gives me goosebumps even now. And, you know, I've been doing this for a while, but that still sounds so fresh and true. Uh, Kathy, would you like to say something? Thank you so much for being part yes. of this commitment. Thank you. Um, well, I second what Kendra has said, but I also um, just want to say I've been on all of these webinars and have been so impressed with the poise of the readers of poetry um, and the discussion of the projects. There's been such a, a wonderful variety of topics and approaches, um, and you may all make us proud. Uh, and also just to relish in this moment. I, I don't know if you all realize how important this opportunity is to you yet. You know, in, in retrospect, I think you'll look back on it as a, a, a really special time. And I, I encourage you to write about it, write about the images and the feelings of experiencing um, these workshops that you're doing, the readings of your work, and the opportunity to work with our wonderful Virginia Poet Laureate, Louisa A. E. Gloria, who has been so kind to, to all of us um, in her two years of, almost two years now of service. So, um, you know, write about it because some of those details get lost over time. And um, I, I feel like the writing about those will become important to you at some time down the road, even potentially as college essays, if you're not already finished with that process. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, is anybody else here from our committee or from the Poetry Society? Is Catherine Fletcher here by any chance? Um, or Steve Booker or Eddie? But in any case, uh, I know that it's been such a great experience working with all of you. So I can't thank you enough again. Uh, and I hope you know we find another opportunity to kind of work to make sure that this goes on into the, the years that follow this. Uh, we're here to celebrate the 11 young poets whose words and winning proposals.
for public poetry projects have won them the distinction of being uh, the first cohort of Virginia young poets in the community. So each one will read a poem or maybe a poem and, uh, or two, and then share a little bit about their projects. They will tell us what it means to them to be selected as one of the Virginia young poets in the community, and then talk a little bit about their public poetry project, where, why they chose it, where they are uh, at this point. That's so exciting. All of you young poets are doing such great things. I'm so pumped. All right, so uh, let's move on and um, listen to uh, Yaira McGodfred from Virginia Beach, um, representing the southeastern region of Virginia. Welcome, Yaira. Hi, um, can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Um, hi, my name is Yaira McGodfred. I am 17 years old, and um, I'm a senior at Green Run Collegiate. Um, in Virginia Beach, which is, which is an international baccalaureate school. Um, it, it just means that the school is very hard. Anyways, um, <laughs> uh, I've been writing poetry for, um, uh, I will, I'll say two years now, it's been two years, and I've been having the most fun writing as much as I can. And um, I love um, writing because, you know, whatever, um, I write whatever I feel and seeing that people around me are feeling the same way just, you know, warms my heart. And I love that very, very much. Um, the poem that I will read today is called Rooftop Scene Execution. I hope you love it. Now that I'm standing on this rooftop, dreaming of going over, you tell me that I'm all that matters. Unfortunately, you can't convince me to stop. Glances have emphasized that I'll never be good enough. Smears have mocked and missed and dismissed my entirety, so I give up. I'm tired of the lifelong war I've been fighting with pain. I'm fed up, but he keeps persisting. Don't tell me you've never tasted the lifelong headache whenever you place a kiss on my cheek. I need a break. I've been dying and withering and you never noticed. Universe hates me endless and made me feel worthless. She continuously tore my mind and pain unendingly stabbed my heart. I'm too damaged and fragmented to still walk this earth. Tell mama I love her. She's everything I wish the world to be. Tell papa I'll miss him. He tried, but no one can save me. And give this note to the others. I promise it explains everything. Now that I'm standing on this rooftop with my past flashing by, I hear universe cackling. I forfeit, she wins. I step to the edge and turn my back to the world I never belonged in. I shove myself over the border and fall like a bird that's been shot in the sky. Back collides into pavement and the last thing I hear are silence. I smile slight before I close my eyes and exhale for the last time. She played dirty but universe has cheated me out of my life. We, the people of my body, gladly retire from this misery. Heart stops, mind at ease. For the first time ever, I have met peace. I am dead. This is my end. Um, so yeah, that is my poem, Rooftop Scene Execution. Um, and my um, public, poetry service project is basically like um, a block party, but it's also a um, fundraiser. Um, um, I chose to do this because I love people and I love being around, um, uh, yeah, a poetry block party. <laughs> um, I love being around um, people and more specifically people who relate to one another and encourage each other. So basically it'll be um, a block party where people can um, share uh, their poetry and um, their um, experiences with mental health and mental illness and things like that. Um, it will be happening in May, which is um, National Mental Health Awareness Month. So um, I hope you guys will be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yaira. And in the, uh, I just said in the chat, your poem is such a searing reminder of how important it is 
uh, to be seen, to be acknowledged, and to kind of like take away some of the, I think there's still some feeling of taboo nowadays about even talking about these subjects. And I'm so glad that you're using poetry as a vehicle for putting this more in the limelight. So thank you. Thank you. All right, shall we move on? I think we shall move on to uh, Leah Morrissey. Hello, my name is Leia Morrissey. I am a senior at Grand Bay High School and I uh, actually just committed to UVA School of Architecture. So that's my future plans right there. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's been quite a journey to get there. Um, actually for my Common App essay that I wrote for the Common App, I actually wrote about poetry and my own experience with it and how I kind of struggled with it during the pandemic. And, Obviously, it was pretty good. <laughs> and so other, uh, my other involvements with poetry, I am involved with uh, the, the literary journal at my high school, The Cupola. Uh, I'm one of the co-editors this year. And Kendra McDonald, we actually uh, interviewed you this year. So I'm excited to read that interview. Thank you again for agreeing to it. And so along with uh, my write in poetry and be involved with the cupola. I'm also uh, very musically inclined and I ha have a great appreciation for the arts, not just your uh, creative write in, but music and art and everything, and especially when it all comes together. And so now I'm going to recite some of my poems. Um, I'm going to recite two. They're pretty short, so I'll think I can get away with two. And this first one was selected by uh, Luisa y Gloria. Uh, it's called Poetry or Paragraphs. And this one I feel is a bit different from my typical written style. So I'm gonna share a second one, which I think is more um, typical of my writing style. But this one's a little different from the other ones. Here it goes. Some people have the ability to write poetry into paragraphs. Me, it's poetry or paragraphs from light feathery words to strict academic tone. Flexible in my writing, but they can never mix. However, I'm never in the extremes of the spectrum. My poetry always too direct. My paragraphs have an element of fun. It's poetry or paragraphs for me, but maybe they're more alike than thought to be. Two expressions of myself, in emotional, revealing poems, in humorous, thoughtful prose. Both are needed to make up myself. One cannot exist and cancel out the other. Impressions of me traced in different forms. So writing is what I do, in poetry or paragraphs. And then this second poem, thank you. The second poem is, uh, I did not submit for uh, the young poet uh, in the community. And it's actually uh, my first time sharing them. So I hope you all enjoy it. It's called I. Love you. Said without ado. It's not quite the three words, eight letters, one, four, three. Just a little piece missing, leaving it unbalanced. One simple letter. Perhaps they couldn't afford any more dolls, but this lack of letter, lack of effort, could be more than meets the eye. A casual phrase, a casual protection from the vulnerability of the meaning. Distance of oceans and depths of seas created in that small moment, or rather, the lack of moment. Distances growing, feelings folded, compressed and shortened, a once heartfelt moment, a spare calling across the way. Idea abstracted, personality extracted, removes the one that loves. Put back the who in love you, the emotions and feelings and memories and beings of I. Love you. For, yeah, I found that very profound, the, the idea of distance and compression, 
all the ironies in between. Did you tell us yet about your poetry project, Leah? Of course. Thank you. And so my poetry project, it's working title, is uh, The Change You Want to See. And it is a two-part poetry workshop in my school. Uh, I had the first meeting this week, and the second one is planned after we come back from spring break. And at these poetry workshops, I'm guiding people and providing prompts on ideas related to change. It's a very general term, but it allows lots of creativity. Um, so this week, we were able to get through uh, two poetry prompts and uh, around the idea of change. And I really loved what I was hearing. Everyone was really great stuff. And the goal with this, is everyone who participates will submit a poem or two, and it will all be compiled and published into a literary journal. And they, everyone will get copies of this. And this will also be part of our school library. And we'll also send this to different, um, like maybe the school board in our city or the city council. And I'm also planning on um, encouraging and organizing some of these poets to uh, go and present their poems on change, either at school board meetings, city council meetings, or uh, other spoken word poetry events. That sounds wonderful. More power to you. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah, and lovely readings. All right, we're moving on and we will welcome Irene Sied, who will read her work and tell us about her public poetry project. I've had the good fortune of meeting Irene in person recently because she signed up for the open mic uh, in downtown Norfolk at the commune for one of the Neon um, open mic events. So that was very fun. Um, hi, my name is Irene Syed, and I'm currently a sophomore at Norfolk Academy in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, my poetry journey started around last year because I felt deeply affected by all of the discrimination, health crises, and genocides occurring in the world. And then my feelings started to come together as poems, and I began sharing them with my local community. Um, because I believe that poetry is a great tool for fostering empathy and unification, and the simplest words can truly have the greatest impact. Um, last year, I was selected for this fellowship, and through that, I have had the opportunity to share my work at numerous open mics, like the one Dr. Gloria mentioned, and also ODU's celebration of Black History Month. Um, as a young Muslim American growing up in the U.S., I've tried to use my poetry to amplify the voices of others, as well as my own. My activism journey began when I was really young and started working with different communities, but recently I've developed my own action project called Pages from Our Lives, which is an initiative that seeks to provide a safe space for teenagers to share their experiences of combating discrimination based on race, religion, gender, or ability. And so my Young Poets in the Community Public Poetry Project is in tandem with that mission because I'm working with the local Hampton Roads refugee children. I have assembled a group of students from my school and area who will be working with the refugees to help them write poetry about their experiences and dreams. And I did this because the refugee community is often overlooked and I wanted them to have a space where their voices could be heard. And through this, I hope to create a collection of poetry that maybe all of you can read and also help the students form friendships and mentorships. And with that, um, today I wanted to share one of the poems I wrote last year after the passing of the Honorable Congressman John Lewis. And it's from the perspective of him when he was younger and it's sort of a reflection on some of the questions he might have asked himself during his time as a young activist. It's called, Why? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the country that stole my ancestors' lives, the country that continuously denies my opinion, 
the country that took away my voice, the country that told me I didn't have a choice, that I wasn't enough. The shackles my ancestors wore left marks on my hands, the houses clansmen burned scarred my skin, the nooses around my brother's necks took all my air. I can't breathe. The winds of injustice are suffocating me. I drink the same water, why not from the same fountain? I eat the same food, why not at the same table? I walk the same earth, why not on the same side of the road? All these people telling me separate, but equal, but what I really see is you compromising black people. What have I done? Why does my color define who I am? Why was I dealt the lesser hand? What happened to my rights? 18 years of war. For what? We fought against taxation without representation. Well, this is discrimination with justification. We live in a nation built on segregation. Hughes said, I too sing, but clearly that message didn't ring. How many years do I have to keep fighting for you, my country, to realize that my voice sounds the same as those white men up in the Capitol building? All these rules they make are doing more hurting than healing, treating our feelings like they're just some plaything. Don't you remember? My brothers have helped you win wars. My ma did your chores. My people swept your floors. For what? I'll tell you how much it hurts to tell your child. Always listen to what the white people say. And even then, there's no guarantee we'll live another day, whether it's getting shot or being told you're a criminal. When you're not, it kills us. But I still have faith, for this is the nation of the strong and the great. I'll be your guide, show you what life's like on the other side. I'll sing for you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound of all the promises you made me. Bravery is rewarded with liberty, but all my men still aren't free. I know you're lost, my country. I know you're blind, but I see, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just amazing. Thank you. Such powerful words. And I echo what everybody is saying um, in the chat. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, such fire. So all of you are just full of this, like just brimming with all of these wonderful, passionate feelings. And I know that that is really where it comes from. Everything we want to change about this world is coming from that same place of love and the desire for connection with others. So keep writing, keep loving, keep that fire going. So um, I uh, see that Shani Porter is here. And uh, I wonder, Shani, are you ready to go? Um, well, my name is Shani. I live in Charlottesville. I'm a senior at Albemarle High School. I've been writing poetry pretty regularly since I was 12 or so. Um, I was really shy and I had a lot of trouble communicating. So it sort of helped me recognize myself and... <laughs> channel my own feelings and connect with people in a way that I hadn't been able to before. So I'm very grateful to this medium for that. Um, I think that I'm going to read my poem, Genie, which is about, I, I wrote it sort of in a fugue state right after the attack on the Capitol um, on January 6th. And it is about the cognitive dissonance of um, looking around at people you've known your whole life and realizing that they are also affected by the intense foundational poison that has corrupted this country in so many ways and trying to like reconcile hope with just realizing the extent of the damage. 
My father can only forgive Jeannie. Out of all you rat bastards, Jeannie gets home free. My father says half this country is dumber than horseshit. And then there is Jeannie, who is old and sweet and collapsing like a souffle in the sun. My father says if I had to forgive somebody, and I do, and he does, and it is Jeannie. I read about the women at the border, women who have lived in their bodies their whole lives, like houses, cheap houses, half safe, half free, half houses, women getting uteri, plural, plucked out of them like toys in operation, tweezing pinchers hit the cotton of their bodies, cue record scratch screaming, cue you lose, but the game doesn't stop. I am writing another doom scroll coup d'etat when someone asks rhetorically, why do you think, why do you think these white, white men, these sadistic soap hoarding men are plucking out these women's uteri? What are they protecting by keeping their collective stomach flat? What possible reason? The answer is in the question and the whole sky is puking. When the Nazis came to Charlottesville in iambic pentameter, we missed them by 20 minutes. We thought we recognized them in the faces in the park. When we stayed at my grandmother's and my white drunk father was rattling off about the new civil war, which we might very well deserve, I thought of all the kids still embroiled in the muck and my mother who raised me pacifistic and abrupt. And he got quiet when I asked him what we were going to do. And it was not rhetorical. When these maggots rushed the palace without sparing a thought to the rubber bullets they stuffed in bright haired college students, someone hears a pig say, I bet they like us now. Clear as a pistol, like you, I could kill you. I could kill you. I could cry. I could cry for all these paper bags pretending to be people I cannot forgive. Right after New Year's, a woman writes an article about the Trump administration's ditch pitch effort to feed the homeless with farm to table at the holidays, which runs out of cash right before Christmas. It is a good article. Ivanka Trump reads it and thinks of the homeless. I can only imagine Ivanka Trump's conception of the homeless. Charles Dickens, Charlie Brown, white, polite, and clean. This will not stand, she says, not in God's country, not at Christmas. She pulls a couple billion out of thin air to make up for missing Christmas. My father has lost his job, his friends, and his newsfeed. He is the angriest person I have ever met. My father says, isn't that crazy? Of course, I do not forgive her. My mother asks me, why does your father want to forgive Jeannie? I bristle. He doesn't want to forgive Jeannie, he has to forgive Jeannie. I don't know why we forgive people who don't deserve it. I don't know whether I should forgive people who aren't sorry. I don't know who can afford to forgive anybody. I don't know how to stop forgiving people. But if I had to forgive somebody, and I do, I do. Oh my God, thank you so much for that. That is such an amazing reading and it just, just goes right here. Thank you, uh, Shani. Um, I know that we're all of the same mind. I, you see the comments in the chat. Uh, and I forgot, did you talk about your project yet? <laughs> uh, so, no, my, no. My project is sort of um, a venue for students to submit their thoughts, feelings, and poems publicly or anonymously, because I think that uh, poetry is a tool for social change because it's about, you know, the core of people. And I know that not everybody considers it a venue accessible to them, but I think it should be accessible. And it's really so, such a fluid, like fundamental thing. So uh, the idea was that everyone would submit a couple lines and then um, myself and some volunteers would put it together into like a poem meant to encompass some part of the general feelings of the community. And 
I am still working on that, but I will absolutely update you when it is complete. Thank you so much. And I so agree with what you said about poetry going to the heart or the fundament of what we are as human beings. And I know that some people say things like, well, poetry does nothing. And there are people who also say poetry does everything. And I mean, poetry cannot, you know, deliver Instacart to your door, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, poetry cannot take care of your student loans, but it does so much more than that, that goes to that fundament that you were talking about. And I, you know, just more power to you. Keep writing, keep doing what you're doing. You are just doing amazing stuff. Thank you. And I look forward to those updates. So we are going to start with a recording um, of a young poet who is not able to be here. And so she sent uh, a recorded version of what she would have said here live. So this is Charlotte Molesky from the Northern region, Arlington, Virginia. And she's in the 11th grade at Washington Liberty High School. Hi, my name is Charlotte Molesky. I go to Washington Liberty High School in Arlington County. Um, and I am part of the Virginia Young Poets in the Community Program. Um, I was also the 2021 uh, Youth Poet Laureate of Arlington County. Um, and I'm so excited to pass the torch to the 2022 Youth Poet Laureate, Kashvir Money, who's also here. Uh, brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, and so one obvious community that I'm a part of is the Arlington community um, and also the broader DMV community. My first formal lesson in poetry was at my, my local middle school um, and it was a lesson in spoken word. Uh, so had I not been introduced to poetry in such a dynamic and exciting and loud and passionate uh, medium such as spoken word, I don't think I would have taken to poetry as I have. Um, and so I, I grew my craft um, and grew my love of poetry, just going to local open mics in Arlington and DC um, and meeting many amazing poets that would become my friends and mentors, um, such as uh, my teammates on the DC Youth Slam team of 2020. Um, and so I want, I want to give back to that community and contribute to it um, because it taught me everything I know. Um, another community that I'm a part of is the queer community. Um, I find endless inspiration um, in my queer identity and the queer people I meet everywhere. Um, and so I want to give back to that community as well because both of those communities sustained me throughout the pandemic. So my proposed poetry project um, has gone through a lot of changes since I submitted it back in November, but its core um, idea is the same. I want to host an open mic at my local high school, um, and the theme will be uh, a post-pandemic poetry sharing and celebration, because so much poetry was written over the pandemic, uh, over, you know, so, so many different topics, so many different important topics, um, and I want to give a space for that work to finally get out there um, and be shared to a live audience in person. Um, I think, you know, we've all been craving uh, being together and sharing art together, and now we finally can. Um, so I want to run that open mic probably in late May, um, involve the, just the, the poets in my community, um, the poets at my high school, the poets in Arlington, um, the poets that I know in the DMV. Um, I want all of those youth poets to uh, be involved in my project. Um, and uh, now I'll read a poem. This poem I submitted um, to apply to this program. It is not a pandemic poem, um, but it's one of my favorites. It's a secret love poem uh, and it's called Eyelashes after Kaveh Akbar. There is a delicate black sliver on the corner of my notebook page, an eyelash. I press one finger atop it. A dark crescent moon now hangs on my fingertip. There is a thin streak on my desk, another eyelash, and another, and another. They weren't there before. Even more come to rest on my page filled with eyelash poems, every letter of every word made from eyelashes. Every stanza sits on straight lines of eyelashes, pouring from a pencil tip, which is an eyelash, 
gripped by my finger with the first singular eyelash, it is now my five fingers with five eyelashes. My whole hand is eyelashes. And my watch hands are telling eyelash time. Ticking past minutes marked by eyelashes, each passing minute I see more eyelashes. They crowd the windowsill and rustle in the trees, in which perch eyelash birds singing eyelash songs, carried to my ears on eyelash winds, which stir the piles that have collected on the floor. Eyelashes flutter upwards. Eyelashes rise to my calves. Eyelashes are climbing my spine. I am up to my neck in eyelashes. And once they arrive at my cheeks, I am bombarded by butterfly kisses. Eyelashes finally reaching eyes to find them wet, spilling over with tears. No eyelashes to hide them because my eyelids are bare. So many eyelashes and none left for me. With a single exhale, I blow, the, I blow them all away, making thousands of eyelash wishes. I hope one reaches you. Well, my biggest piece of poetry advice um, for new poets. Read more poetry. Um, here are three resources to read poetry um, that are accessible and that I love. One, Poetry Magazine. I happen to have a print subscription, um, but their magazine is online for free um, for like the past 20 years, every, every monthly edition. It's on their website. Um, two, Poem a Day. Uh, just Google it um, and you can have a poem put in your inbox every day. And you can read a poem every day. Three, um, one of my personal favorites, uh, Split This Rocks, The Quarry, um, a social justice poetry database. Um, so you can search poems based on topic, based on artist identity, all that sort of thing. Um, you can also go to Button Poetry and, you know, just binge if you like spoken word. Um, you can look at archives of uh, poetry slam competitions. Just go down those YouTube rabbit holes, but however you do it, please take in more poetry. That is so cool. And yeah, amazing resources. I do agree. Read more poetry, write more poetry. It just goes together. Um, before we go on to our next reader, I want to take a moment to, to say something about another a young poet in the community who cannot be here this afternoon, but she sent me a bunch of her literary magazine called Black Dragon. This is Renee Anderson. Uh, she is in the 11th grade of Appomattox Regional Governor's School in Chester, Virginia, and she actually completed her project. She had targeted uh, February for completion because of Black History Month. And her goal was to create a literary magazine centering around Black narratives, Black culture, Black life. And she invited um, writers, student writers from her high school to contribute to this magazine. And they put it together, printed copies, stapled them. I got a bunch and I've been giving them away. And she's also with her friends giving them away in her own community. And I think they, there are plans of printing more. Uh, and I thought maybe I could read her poem. Um, she's not here to read it, but it's very short. It's the poem that we chose for young poets in the community. And uh, again, this is Renee Anderson of Chester, Virginia with a poem, When We Offer Only Prayers. Baba Walker, 55, a black transgender woman, gone. Hail Mary, full of grace. Michelle Tamika Washington, 40, a black transgender woman, gone. The Lord is with you. Jazeline Ware, 34, a black transgender woman, gone. Blessed are you among. Brooklyn Lindsay, 32, a black transgender woman, gone. Women. Brianna B.B. Hill, 30, a black transgender woman, gone. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mia Green, 29, a black transgender woman, gone. Jesus. Ashanti Carmen, 27, a black transgender woman, gone. Holy Mary, Mother of God. 
Pebbles the dime, dime, doe. 24, a black transgender woman gone. Pray for us, sinners. Tracy Single, 22, a black transgender woman gone. Now and at the hour of Paris Cameron, 20, a black transgender woman gone. Our death. Bailey Reeves, 17, a black transgender woman gone. And again, that is from her poem, When We Offer Only Prayers, Renee Anderson. So uh, moving on, folks. Now we would uh, like to listen to you, Yunseo, Yunseo Chung of Yorktown. Hello, um, my name is Yun Sa Chung. I'm a young poet in the community from Yorktown. Um, I am a senior at Grafton High School and I'm debating between a few colleges right now, but I'm leaning towards Columbia. And um, yeah, and the poem that I'm gonna read is titled Atlantis. And I wrote it, I wrote it um, for specifically like as a slam piece and it was written partly in collaboration with um, another slam poet in the area, Salma uh, Ar Aru. So um, yeah. There is no paradise here. Survival is the only priority. Mind the mainstream. When it sweeps you away, whispers terrorists on 9-11, unravels your religion on TV, hijab undone to please the white savior, remember why you're here. Your mother gave up her life for you, chose a suitcase over her career, chose her daughter's future over her own. Be grateful, it could have been worse. Ignore their name calling, their only distractions trying to drown you while you're not looking. Here, you will never be smart, only Asian success, just a stereotype, but play along. Be thankful they say your name in the first place instead of leaving you to die nameless. When your innocence falls overboard, stolen by grown men, don't go in after it. Keep rowing. Pretend you don't see. Pretend you don't mind. You're a kid, I know, but that's how things are here. They'll break a hole in the hull, leave you sinking, then show up with lifeboats, claim you at their convenience. Is America an ocean of opportunity or a dead sea? We can't survive here. They never taught us how to swim. Are we meant to die choking on salt as casualties of the American dream? Or were we never part of your country in the first place? The water is too dark to tell for sure. Either way, we can't stop to look or drop the anchor of our boats. Hold on to your culture, else the salt eats the metal and we're left stranded in our homes. Yeah, and my poetry project is basically um, working with the Teens with a Purpose Center in Norfolk and publishing an anthology of um, kind of communal poetry to, to have kind of the voices, I guess, of Nor Norfolk and Hampton Roads together in one book because um, I've experienced like firsthand myself and like seeing others and like just seeing how cathartic and freeing and healing poetry can be. So I think it'd be a really powerful and um, moving project. So yeah, I'm working as an editor to kind of work in the Teens with a Purpose Center to work with the children there and also throughout the community to collect poetry. Thank you, Yunseo. Are you going to be downtown on the 9th for the, I think there's a program there um, for the next selection process for the next Hampton Roads Youth Poet Laureate? Yeah, I, I really wish I could have gone, but I have something else that day. Okay. So I don't think well, I, I might meet you there because I'm going to go. So. Oh, nice. All right. But thank you again. Thank you so much. One other young poet is unable to be here. And I just also wanted to mention uh, her name, Leah Gunn of Bristol, Virginia, who is a ninth grader at Virginia High School. And if you go to my website and look at the section, there's one dedicated solely to the young poets in community program. And there will be updates on all of the projects as they come towards com conclusion. 
So please keep checking back between now and the end of June, which is the end of the school year for all of our young poets also. So I'm gonna move on to Stephanie Gomez, who is here. Stephanie, welcome again. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gomez and I'm a senior at Kedawan High School, Sioux Fauquier County, Virtual Virginia. And um, this contest is actually the first, first time I wrote poetry. And this is my um, reading poem, Hidden Beat. A hidden beat that you can hear like rhythmic sling, you can't escape, hidden hypnotizing, bringing together people we never knew, so we always knew. A hidden beat draws us in, draws us hard, can't get out, Hidden messages helps us through life goals and language cultures new. Hidden beat bring us whole, bring us bring passion, listen. And for my community project, I had made postcards and I had mailed them out in um, February to the faculty and staff at Kettle One and um, um, sending my postcards poems. I'm hoping to show how different types of people um, can be brought together through passion of writing. And I selected color one because it was a diverse group of people. And I'm hoping to um, bring it through social emotional engagement. And sometimes teachers, faculty and staff at schools or have a lack of appreciation and acknowledgement. And I wanted to show them that they are seen by someone than no one because they had received things to thank them. And hopefully they um, has me sending them my poem postcards. Um, it will make them happy and filled with joy. Thank you, Stephanie. Please don't mind the noise in the background. I think people are blowing leaves in their yard. So sorry about that. But uh, Stephanie, I have received emails from some of the faculty or staff from your school. They've actually reached out through my contact page on my uh, Poet Laureate website. And they have said, uh, it's such a great uh, you know, gesture from you to be able to do this. And they are very appreciative of what you've done. So they, they said, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think now we have Adavia. So we're going to um, move on to Adavia. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's so wonderful to know that people are so appreciative of what you've done. Adavia? All right. Then I would try to be quick. Um, so um, I have this poem that I wrote. Sorry. Um, I think I, it's a it's like the called the sea, and it's essentially this um, I guess metaphor for um, mental um, health and illness, and how we're like caught in the storm, and it's really hard to get out and whatnot. So I'm just gonna read it real quick, and then I'll talk about my project. Oh, and I'm sorry. My name's Davia. I go to Colonial Forge High School, although currently I'm kind of doing a homeschool thing. So. The cool salt air blinds as we tread on our littered paths. Screaming minds, inaudible, silenced by the howling winds of painful reminders, sending so many into early graves. Voice whispering, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. Our state's more than rough. Voices, voices whispering, why are we more tough? Slowly agonizing, becoming slaves or our own expectations, everyday frustrations. They pour into the sea we are already struggling in, thunder pounding disappointments, the lightnings of anxiety piercing our hearts, screaming minds silenced by the crashing waves, and waves slamming into our bodies, causing us to plummet towards the sea floor, waves of trial, grief, and sorrow. We are drowning in the sea of unknown doubts, of unknown doubts, uncertainty, ah, sorry, anxiety. Our struggles coil around our feet like a snake and we are anchored down. Our arms flail as we struggle. 
We kick fiercely, desperate to be free, longing for glee, glee not reduced to a mere detour. Hearts longing to soar, yet we only seem to succeed in swallowing the bitter saltiness of reality and, we, and becoming exhausted. Everything hurts and eventually we give in. Fighting against the anchor is useless. Fighting against the monstrous waves are useless. Fighting against the sea is useless. We stop struggling, stop trying, it's useless. We break down and we drown. Little dare to search the sea we constantly battle in. Some of the ones drowning refuse to be found. We are bound to the shame because dare us to admit any issue with our mental health. We are cast into the flames saying I'm working on mental wellness is frowned upon so little can offer help. And even smaller can receive aid, the help they so desperately needed, even if all, it, all was needed was a hand to hold or a sign they aren't alone, someone to trust so we don't fade to dust. Yet we still, yet we are still destitute. Ah, hold on, it deleted. Okay, sorry. Yet still destitute we remain in any solutions regarding our mental health. That's it. Can you tell us about where you are with your project, Adavia? Thank you. I just got the confirmation where I can hold my um, little poetry cafe. The plan was to do it at school, but that didn't work out so well. So I asked for some help and you said, I can do it at a library. And they just sent me an email. Um, so all I have to do is just book a spot and we're good to go. <laughs> so that's nice. And um, yeah, essentially it's about how poetry is a good expressive tool and can really just help you express your feelings and just vent on a piece of paper. And it doesn't matter that what your skill level is. You could be doing it for 10 years, one year, a month, and it will still work. So, yeah. All right, more power to you. I'm glad that worked out for you. And I love the images of the sea and drowning. And, you know, that's such a contrast to what we really need, which is more of, I don't know, a tsunami of care right? So more power to you. Thank you, Adavia. And thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Last but not least this afternoon, we have Kashvi, Kashvi Romani, who is the, I guess you are the incoming po youth poet laureate of Arlington, right? Is it Arlington? I am, yes. Congratulations. That one I didn't hear until now. So congrats. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely love writing and I was so happy to receive this opportunity. Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm Kashvi. I am a sophomore in high school and I go to two schools, Rockridge High School and the Academies of Loudoun, which is a magnet school in my county. Um, and I've been writing since I was like six years old, but um, when I really started getting serious about poetry was when I was selected to be on the DC Slam Poetry team. And um, as Ms. Gloria mentioned, I am the newest Youth Poet Laureate for um, Arlington, Virginia as part of the DMV. There's three of us. Um, and then some of my other more recent accolades have been winning a Young Arts Merit Award in Slam Poetry, um, being the first place um, winner in the Poetry Society of Virginia Annual Student Contest. I've also been published in Rattle, Brown Girl Magazine, The Young Arts Poetry Anthology, LCM, and several others. And I'm so grateful for all of those opportunities. And um, the poem that I'm going to be reading for you guys today is called um, My Dada in a Day. And uh, I am Indian American, so Dada means grandma in my language. And this is kind of a poem just comparing my grandmother to myself living in India, living, uh, living in America, living a very privileged life as opposed to the life my grandmother and other people from her generation had to endure growing up. When the clouds part, my grandmother is on the move. Her locks flap in the wind. She hides the flaps on her skin. She always finds a way to burrow inside herself and position her limbs in the shadows of the sun. She runs faster each time reality catches up. India rises from its trout-lipped slumber, and her basket is already filled with buds. Jasmine, 
sugar coats her already strained smile she'll have to fix that by noon and prepares to string itself on garlands but that works its milky color to a lather and scrubs until a bumpy rash of rose envelops her brow not cream she'll try again tomorrow at eleven, she bustles down flights of stairs, kneading dough until the salt that drips from her face is enough seasoning, and the blood that washes over hands hidden with henna flavors the dough with sindor. So she sweeps the mark across her forehead and prays, clasps her hands together, asks for a new face. The clock finally chimes twelve, and she dons four tiffins of lunch and a crimson sari to wash out the weakness. Her feet are quick. Her husband's are quicker. When he's through, her wavering teeth feel more like ocean than stronghold, attacking its own hands over and over and recrudescing in waves over and over at 3 p.m. And she practices teetering spoons on her palms to prepare for the weight of the world on her shoulders. Her daughter-in-law is growing grayer and frailer by the day. Men like a little meat on the bones. Or cooking for the da. Her niece, who once painted the solar system on her eyelids, let her planets get lost on Earth. The ones who aren't pretty have to be smart. Ludda can't marry them off right away. And her daughter, who runs at the same time as her every morning in a country across the sea to connect with the life she once had, shuffles down a gated neighborhood in neon Adidas while Ludda turns around to watch for hungry eyes and sandals that peel at the heels. The night jar sings in tune with her landline. Quiet, subliminal darkness unfolds the cloak of nighttime. 13,000 miles away, me and my sister are greeting the sun. We prattle about carnivals and tank tops, about new friends, new opportunities, about technology, about goals, about our life. Lepta, when will you come to see us? Soon, Bangaru, soon. Then she tucks herself in with the blanket that steams like rice and dreams her wishes into our realities. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> and, um, oh, sorry, did you want to say something, Mr. Gloria? Okay. Oh, yeah. um, Thank you. Of course. Um, and then my Young Poet in the Community proposal um, shifted a little bit from when I first had it. But um, right now, it is a work in progress. I plan to have um, multiple events scattered throughout, um, thanks to like the help of my amazing team, a lot of young poets in the community who will be receiving an email from me this evening. Um, and uh, you, of course, Missy Gloria, as well as Roscoe Burnham's, who has been a great help throughout all of this. Um, and uh, this this thing that I've altered is um, going to be a community and state-based event for Northern Virginia. And it's going to be like a series of different events, the first of which is going to be a poetry reading for National uh, Poetry Month, which is going to be in April this, this month, um, at the end of this month, where some experienced poets will be able to present their work to aspiring writers, as well as how they came to be. Because I know that there's always questions, and then oftentimes, and I have the inclination to do this too, just say, oh, just work hard and you'll get there. But sometimes writers aren't sure where to start, and they assume that they have to wait till they're older, but um, a lot of us didn't, and that's why we're here right now. So I kind of just want to bring more arts to my community since it's very STEM-based, and it would be nice to see more writing, more art, more, po more poetic works throughout my community. Absolutely. I thought we were going to put A in STEM, right? STEAM, the arts. And I don't know what happened. Yes. I heard that there was a plan. I think Yo-Yo Ma had proposed it at some point some years back but i don't know what happened to that but yeah uh go more power i love what you're doing and again all of you are so so inspiring um i i don't think that i'm the only one that feels this way I, kendra has been like wiping tears throughout this whole thing <laughs> so uh we have a little time so i think we can give like maybe six or six or so minutes to anyone in the audience who would like to drop a question or a comment for our young poets in the community i'm sure they'd be happy to take some questions and um you know just share what you felt at their reading because I know that all of you have been 
very moving in the ways in which you presented your work and it, it just shows that uh, we made good choices. I'm so happy. <laughs> so there is a question in the chat. What was the most difficult part of your participation in this project? And anybody can take it. Um, the question just go um, right again. Um, I know I just spoke, but I love this question. Um, I think a lot of people think, and um, a lot of people have said, and maybe they feel this way, that, that starting it is the most difficult part. But I think that in the beginning, you have all this adrenaline, all this um, passion, which, I mean, I still continue to have. But it's really the in-between that is the most difficult part for me, the transitioning from having this idea, developing it, doing all the behind-the-scenes work, to actually publicizing it and, and getting people to come to this project, getting poets to get in engaged. I feel like that's the most discouraging part because oftentimes um, we think that we can make like anyone can be a writer, but a lot of people have this mental block in their mind, whether that be they think they can't write, um, which that's not true for anyone, or they just aren't interested in a project. And sometimes that's something we have to accept, which has always been really difficult for me. But um, that transitional phase, I'd say, has been most difficult in the past and is proving to be very strenuous this time around as well. Yeah, and I, I, what you say is so true. I hope you've all found good allies in your community because this question just reminds me, I got an, um, an email update from one of the middle school um, young poets in the community, Abby Willis, and she wrote just two nights ago to say that she is making some progress finally in her project. Uh, and she wanted to do a, a poetry mural in her community. And she was having a hard time getting permits to do that. And she, one line in her email stuck out to me really strongly. And she said, it was very hard to get people to take me seriously because of my youth. And so I think that that is a real thing. But she found, she said, she's very happy that she found out in the process who are her actual allies. So she found out that all the superintendents of the public school system are now behind her back. They are letting her do, instead of a permanent mural, a traveling poetry mural through all the public school system. So she's even gotten more she's gonna get more coverage than, than her original plan. And so she said, I was very frustrated at the beginning, but now I'm so um, encouraged to know that there are actually people who believe in me. Or do you have questions for each other? Because I, I know that uh, Steve dropped uh, a comment earlier um, that I didn't have time to read, but I think the gist of it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, a wonderful idea that he says, might happen is for all of you, you and your cohort right now of young poets in the community to serve as a kind of transition team uh, of ambassadors for the next batch to share uh, lore and you know what you've learned in the process and just you know network with whoever is coming in as the next cohort. So that is a great idea, Steve. So we all need to sit down again and think about how we're gonna carry that out too. Um, do any of you have questions for each other or comments? But uh, I really want to thank you all for sharing such wonderful, inspiring uh, work. Uh, is there a memory that started your poetic journey? Um, Kashvi, is this your question? Who are you asking? Anybody here? Yes, any of the young poets. Yeah. Would anyone like to? Um, um, so it was actually like, like my poetic journey just started like a year ago, actually. So, uh, but I think it was in sophomore, on my sophomore year and we were online and not a lot of people were submitting poetry like that because I guess COVID made us very unpoetic and I was not, I wasn't one of the poets anyways. And I, sort of I'm thinking. I got this one prompt that inspired me and it was just one word and I don't remember the first word. I know one of them was dread, but that was my second word. And when I wrote about the poem, I felt very like relieved in a way. And my teacher did enjoy giving like just a small touch of poetry. And I think what hit it home was when we did a, like one of those community poems where like you like, 
write some like stanzas and you guys smash them together yeah that was a, what really smashed it home for me i was like i love this thing so that's what started it for me it was online school with my creative writing teacher um i remember uh kind of what got me into poetry um so before it really started in 10th grade for me and before that i wrote poems but i really like, restricted myself a lot um i would like only write in a certain form but um when I was in 10th grade, um, one night I was just thinking about uh, mythology because I love mythology and about the story of Icarus. And suddenly I just, an idea popped in my mind and I was like, that's a really good thought. And I just wrote it down and like, I kept writing a stream of consciousness less, like, and I got a poem from that and I just wrote, as it came to me and didn't like set any restrictions or anything on myself. And I kind of realized from that, like I can write whatever I want and not write it in a specific way. And then um, I'm very much, that's kind of uh, how I still write today, really very much a uh, stream of consciousness. Like as I think it, I write it. Um, I really, like once I get that inspiration, I write it down. And so that's really stayed with me to this day with my poetry writing. Amazing. Yes. I, I love uh, turning to mythology too. It's so um, such a rich uh, field to explore. Uh, it's like you can never get everything out, right? There's something to go back to. Uh, all right, Yaira and then Shani. Um, so my poetry journey actually started um, in like fall of 2020. I know that's like very oddly specific, but that is completely true. Um, so um, Holland's University was um, having a poetry competition and um, whoever won got um, their tuition paid fully. And I was like, okay, um, I don't really write poetry. At the time I only wrote songs. That's all I knew how to write. So I was like, okay, let me try this. It should be the same thing. So um, I wrote two poems. I got my teacher to edit them. She said they were really wonderful. And I was like, um, yes, I completely agree. Lyrics are poetry as well. Um, but but um, yeah, so, you know, it was my teacher actually that, you know, convinced me to do, um, to continue doing poetry, which I adore her very much. I'm still in contact with her. Um, so I didn't win the competition, obviously, because it was my first time writing poetry. Um, and then uh, my teacher put me, uh, she uh, gave, well, the Muse Writer Center was having um, applications for the um, Teen Writers Fellowship. I applied. I did not think I was going to get in, but I got in. Um, and just being um, a part of like a group of writers who write so many different things, have different writing styles. It very much influenced um, what I thought of poetry because I thought it was just one single verse and everything had to have a rhyme scheme and you know all this beautiful stuff. But poetry isn't just like one, you can't write poetry just like one specific way. So I loved like being influenced um, by them. So yeah. That's my poetry journey. Sounds like a great poetry journey that is ongoing onto better and better things. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Shani? Uh, yeah, um, I've been writing my whole life, but I can pinpoint, I think, the beginning of my poetry journey in 2016 when I went into middle school and I was so shy, I like, couldn't talk to anybody. Like I couldn't... Um, really even raise my hand to ask her to the bathroom because I would get so worked up about it <laughs> and it was new it was new for me um and the first poem I ever wrote was about my English class there was a kid who sat next to me uh whose binder was always on my desk and I was always moving the binder to get it off my desk um and they were always putting it back and the first poem I ever wrote was called please get your binder off my desk <laughs> And it was terrible, but <laughs> it was the first time I had really conceptualized myself as like having real feelings about this sort of stuff that I could articulate in a way that made sense to me. 
Uh, so I read it out loud in creative writing and people liked it and they were like, oh, hey, I totally get that. I also hate when people put their binder on my desk. So I was, um, I was hooked. That's a wonderful story. Thank you so much. And again, uh, thank you. I can't thank you enough for sharing of your time this afternoon, Saturday. It's a beautiful afternoon. Wouldn't you much rather be out there blowing leaves off your lawn? No. <laughs> but we're here and thank you. I, I hope to hear so much good news from you, so much poetry news. Before we go, I want to uh, ask you to mark your calendars for an Earth Day program that will also help us round out National Poetry Month this year at 7 p.m. on Friday, April 22. I'd like you to join me again. The links will be uh, sent out closer to the date, but this is gonna be a program uh, focusing on poetry as ecology of care. So it's gonna be an Earth Day reading conversation featuring four poets, Tyree Day, Padma Perez, and Diane Woodcock and Claire Womanholm. Um, so I will put the information or the date information for you so that you can mark your calendars. I'm not very good at this cut and paste thing. So, or my fingers are sticky or my keyboard is sticky or both. So, but thank you very much. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you, the muse. Thank you, Kendra and Kathy and Steve and everybody in the Poetry Society of Virginia who has been so supportive. Thank you again to the Academy of American Poets and the Mellon Foundation, which would, you know, without their help, this would not be possible. Thank you and have a great evening.